we have a major problem that a small percentage of patients they go for a relapse we have a consensus for the primary treatment but when it comes to relapse we have a lot of difference of opinion and today this webinar is going to focus on that controversy or that confusion which we have about what is the best management for the relapsed clubfoot we are really fortunate to have four continent experts with us the first speaker of the today's webinar is jos barkendu i'm going to introduce uh, him shortly then we have a christoph from europe john and viraj are from asia and monica is from latin america so uh, let me give a short introduction of them jos barkendu is at present a professor at university of iowa but he did his undergraduate and postgraduate study in madrid spain after that he migrated to usa in 1991 and again he did a residency program at university of iowa and from that journey from the residency at present he is a professor at the same place his major practice is concerned 75% of his practice is related to club foot and he runs clinics of club foot three times in a week so he is a huge number of patients of club foot in addition to that he has a, another interest and in, that's a musculoskeletal oncology he is a executive director of ponsetti international association so i am sure that uh, he has learned this technique from the master and he has taken the practice of masters also so he is going to share most important tips which we are not knowing at this stage he is going to tell us that also the second expert panelist is christoph reidler he is head of pediatric orthopedic at uh, spessing hospital vienna austria again he has a more than 20 years experience in managing this uh, deformity he said that he has a largest club foot clinic in europe he is also advisory board at uh, ponsetti internationals and in addition to club foot he has a uh, interest in congenital limb deformity and gait analysis another doyen of uh, pediatric orthopedic is from india dr john mukhopadhyay he is director and head of the department of paras hmri hospital in patna he is chairman of orthopedic research and education foundation which is on a forefront of spreading the education all over the country he is also a member of pediatric fracture group expert group of ao international and he has also written our chapters on the club foot management the monica nogrilia she is from uh, sao paulo state hospital and she is associate professor over there he is also advisor of ponsetti international association and a past president of ponsetti latin america group she has also done a fellowship in limb lengthening and deformity correction from baltimore the young dynamic uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon from nagpur he is a director that's dr viraj shingade is a director at children orthopedic care institute in nagpur he runs a ngo non government organization and he provide free rehabilitation service to almost 4000 children and he also carries out free surgical camps he is a two major contribution in the uh, field of pediatric orthopedic that is a one stage osteotomy correction for the neglected club foot and a surgical treatment of congenital radio ulnar synostosis so with this four experts and one guest lecturer we are going to have a good interaction just those who are on the like watching this webinar on the youtube they can whatsapp their question on the number 7339414779 and the last thing is about the next webinar on the 6th november we have a interesting webinar on the upper extremity uh, problem in cerebral palsy and we have a expert from boston children hospital carly willerbin uh, she is going to talk on the same thing and we have a uh, two great experts on the field that is peter waters from boston children hospital and mary beth isaki from dallas so they are going to share their expert uh, knowledge for this webinar so please uh, take a note of this webinar so now i will stop sharing i will request uh, taral to tell you something about the poll and then i will run the poll 
Okay, so in India, uh, we always start everything with politics and poll, and uh, this dif- is no different. We want to have the public opinion, you know, what people feel about a given condition before they are taught. So I would request Dhiran Bhai to start sharing slides, and uh, after he has uh, shared the question and the possible options, I will give you the options on the poll, and people can poll. You will have 20 seconds to poll, and then Dhiran Bhai will give uh, his expert comments and then we'll proceed on. So there are five questions and we'll do them one by one. Then by over to you. Yes, so there are five questions and each question there are four options. So you just have to select one of the option. So it's very easy, but this is going to be very interesting because it will give us idea about what we think before the webinar. So the first question is, according to you, what is the most common cause of relapse? A, inadequate correction, B, improper brace, C, poor compliance for the bracing, and D, genetics of the condition of a child. So now it's open. You can give your vote. There is a very close contest. Of course, the winner... Uh, here some seems to be poor compliance for bracing, but other are in close, uh, uh, you know, contest behind. People should vote five seconds more to vote, and then I'm going to close this poll. Okay, so like the majority of the participants, they feel that the major reason of relapse is a poor compliance of brace. It's a human tendency of an uh, orthopedic surgeon, not an orthopedic surgeon, any human being, to blame someone else. We don't take our responsibility on ourselves, and we usually blame that it's a parent's fault, and because of that, there is a relapse. But fine, we will see what is the opinion of uh, our experts. Okay, shall we go to the next question? Yes, sir. Yeah. So question two. In your practice, how frequently you see relapse by the time child completes the age four? Usually we stop bracing at this year, uh, at that stage. So by that time, the first option is in a less than 5% of cases. Option B, between 5 to 10% of cases. Option C, between 10 to 20%. And option B, more than 20%. Oh, exercise your right. Oh, a real close competition. Five more seconds to vote. Uh, please keep voting, everybody. So basically, like the A, B, and C, one third of the participants, they feel that in less than 5%, one third of them, they feel that it's between 5 to 10%. And one third feel that it's between 10 to 20 percent. Okay, so we go to the third question. This is really interesting and like, uh, okay, so a six year old child has relapsed, club foot. Your treatment will be option A, Ponsetti treatment. This child was treated well, and after that, there is a relapse. So option A is doing a Ponsetti technique again. Option B, postromedial release or a soft tissue release. Option C, postromedial release plus osteotomy. And option D, Jess, that's a Joshi's experiment and epi- epidemiology. Yeah. Okay, so almost uh, 75% of the participants, they will go for a Ponsetti treatment. However, there is almost uh, 6 to 15%, they go for soft tissue release, soft tissue release plus osteotomy or external fixator. Okay, the next question, that's question four. What percentage of club foot cases required tibialis anterior tendon transfer in your practice? Option A, less than 5%. Option B, 6 to 10%. Option C, 11 to 15%. And option D, more than 15%. 
Okay, so um, the majority is like uh, forty-one percent says that uh, in their practice, six to ten percent of the patients they required uh, tibialis anterior tendon transfer. However, there are like uh, sixteen percent and thirteen percent they say that more than fifteen percent of the cases also required this surgery. So that says that relapse is a really big challenge for us. And the last question. At what age do you consider tibialis anterior tendon transfers? Then there should have been one more option. Never. Never. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this is the result. Like fifty percent of the uh, participants, they say that uh, they go for this surgery between three to four years. Okay, so with this, we end the poll over here, and now it's over to you, Jaws. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. This is uh, uh, a real an honor and a privilege to uh, participate in this uh, webinar. Um, thank you to the participants uh, for being here, and I hope that this webinar uh, helps to, uh, um, you know, with the treatment of, of relapses, which is, uh, uh, as, as, uh, as we know, is one of the main challenges in, in the treatment of clubfoot. I would like to thank also the organizers, and especially uh, Monica Nogueira, Dr. Nogueira, and Dr. Christoph Radler uh, for uh, joining uh, into this webinar for their expertise uh, on the treatment of clubfoot and relapses. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, um, uh, when I was thinking about, about the topic, uh, I, I thought about, you know, do we really understand clubfoot? And I put clubfoot in quotes uh, and we will see why, and the Ponseti method. And, and this is based really in uh, 65 years of experience from Dr. Ponseti first uh, paper uh, up to today. Um, I have no disclosure other than um, I am founder and board of directors of the nonprofit uh, Clubfoot Solutions. Um, so it's important uh, to recognize Dr. Ponseti um, because he uh, was the person who really changed the paradigm of how we treat clubfoot today, but not just because of the treatment per se, but also because of the understanding. And we all know that his paper in 1963, um, in which he described his treatment and, and also described his main problem at the time, which was relapses, um, uh, really was not understood by the community and the papers after uh, on this uh, biology and biomechanics of the foot were not well understood as we all know. And I think until his paper, his book was uh, published in 1996 with, with his uh, really philosophy of clubfoot understanding and treatment that uh, the community didn't start uh, uh, learning and, and really uh, start changing the mind for, for how to, uh, um, how to treat a uh, clubfoot uh, based on the basic concepts. So, so it's very important that, that we recognize his uh, amazing contribution and really a gift that give us uh, for treating these patients uh, that are so common in our practices. And I think one of the main uh, issues here is, is how do you conceptualize clubfoot? Uh, we are all familiar with the, um, most people, uh, uh, in research have done dissections of the foot and, and, and trying to understand what's the problem in the foot. Um, we as orthopedic surgeons uh, are very concentrated on the imaging and, and how the bones look like. And, and then there are many hypotheses thinking that, you know, when you do a dissection, and this is the classic picture by Dr. Ponseri, you can see that the uh, navicular is completely displaced, uh, is misshaped, 
uh, the talus is also mis, uh, misshaped um, and, and the midfoot is misshaped. And, and, and the issue here is that just because these tissues are misshaped doesn't mean that is the central point of the biology for clubfoot. Um, as Pirani beautifully demonstrated in the study in 2001 with MRI, you can see here that you do the MRI before the uh, three minute stars and it's the same pictures like the specimen. And then three weeks into the treatment, the navicular um, is already starting to be in position and changing a little bit the shape and the tail has changed the shape. And then by the six weeks of treatment, uh, the bones behave normally. And the fact is that in a study that they did, um, the, uh, uh, the, the amount of growth on the talus specifically, it was four times the normal side, just because what happened is these osteocardiologist uh, structures were just completely constrained. And we know that when cartilage is constrained, it doesn't grow very well, and the same is bone. So, so the, the, abnorm the abnorm biological abnormality in clubfoot is not in the bones. And, and kids with clubfoot has no leg length discrepancy uh, other than 10% that might have one or one and a half centimeters. So, so there's no biological abnormality in the bones in the foot. What you can see, and clinically you see this frequently, is that when you see these patients, either from day one to adults, there's a difference, especially you notice that in patients with bilateral, with unilateral cases in which the leg is a little bit thinner. And, and when you look at the specimens of patients of clubfoot, you can see that the gastrosolius, and this is, is smaller, and look at the Achilles tendon in the normal side is very thin and maybe 20% of the length of the complex of the muscles and tendon and the muscles are very nice and well developed. In the clavus side, the tendon is very thick. It's almost half of the complex muscle tendon and the muscles are very small and also has some kind of uh, 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 fibrosis like in between the fibers. And, and that is where doc, when Dr. Ponseri and other studies have done and evaluate these muscles and soft tissues and found that there's an increased cellularity and increased uh, amount of collagen. And it's also some collagen in between muscle fibers. So what happened in clubfoot then is not that there's a problem with the foot. Uh, it's not a problem with the shape of the bones that they do respond to, uh, to the mechanical stresses and they recover after the treatment is that there's an abnormality in the soft tissues and muscles on the lower extremity. Uh, in this study by Ippolito, uh, which a fellow with Dr. Ponset in the 70s, a professor in Rome, uh, they did a very smart uh, study by doing MRIs. And this is an MRI of a newborn baby, no treatment. And you can see here that the amount of um, uh, muscle and the uh, characteristics, the MRI characteristics of the muscles are very different between the normal and the athletic side. I mean, it's about 30 to 40 percent smaller. And if you look at the anterior tip, it has a lot of white around. The stensors are kind of very, very little developed. And, and the peroneals and also the gastrosolius, posterior tip, and, and uh, flexors. So so this is not a problem of one muscle uh, in clubfoot. And I'm saying that specifically talking about anterior tip, as we will discuss, is a problem of development of the lower extremity and, and affects all the compartments from the knee down. Now, most people have seen some cases in which you do the casting and then for reasons that is like, oh, you take the cast off and the you know, and then this, this much swelling and everybody's puzzled because, oh, why this happened? Well, this happened for two reasons. One reason is because when you are doing the casting, you stretch too much or you put the cast too tight. But there's no question that some cases, you know, many cases don't swell up too much. There's a little puffiness, but it's okay. But others are not. The more 
and we don't know the genetics, but there might be several genes that are leading to what we call club food. And, and what happened is that the neurovascular bundles also have a soft tissue around them. And when these cases are a little bit stiffer, and this is what happens usually when there are stiffer cases, those neurovascular bundles are also have a stiffening of the, of the uh, tissues, the soft tissues around them. And so when you are stretching the foot with your technique, then you, there might be some compression. And, and if I ask, you know, what do you think would be the problem with this uh, swelling? Um, well, yeah, okay, you can, you wait and, and let it go, but some people keep doing casting and casting and the cast comes off and so forth. And, and, and the problem is when you get this much swelling, the interchange of oxygen at the level of the muscles and soft tissues, but specifically the muscles get decreased. Yeah, the artery is able to put uh, blood into the leg, but the veins are and the and the lymphatic system had difficulties getting the blood out, and then there's an stasis in there, and then the oxygen is much less for these tissues, and this is extremely important and also has tremendous implications on relapses because what happened is that. Uh, these two studies from the group of Matt Dobbs and Christina Burnett, um, they did an MRA of club food and they, you can see that there's sometimes abnormalities in the blood vessels. For people that did surgeries for many years, sometimes you get into big trouble because the circulation was not that great and because there's potentially abnormalities in these blood vessels. And the results of these cases, and this is another study by the group uh, of resistant club feet, uh, feet that are very difficult and they swell up and it's very hard to get them around. You can see here, especially in the middle column, the amount of um, really necrosis of muscles that is produced. And, and you can imagine that these cases are not going to do very well in the long term. So you know, club foot already has a smaller muscles and if you get into this kind of situation, then these muscles are suffering much more. And you can imagine that then the relapse rate in this case is much higher. Actually, in our statistics, it's about 60 to 70%, even using the praise. So this is a very, very important point that everybody has to take in mind. Swelling in club food is tremendous, has tremendous implications for, for um, the follow-up and the outcome of these patients. Now, in this same study by Polito, they look at patients that have finished the treatment, and this was a four or five years old kid that finished the uh, casting and the bracing. The leg looks very nice. It's a little thinner compared with the other one. And, you know, it looks about the same size, but when you do the MRI, you can see here that the muscles are about 50% is smaller than the other side. Now the, the fat is a little bit thicker. And so from the outside, it looks like it's about the same, but the inside, these muscles are not very well developed. And that is what it leads to relapses. And so relapses in club food are coming because the muscles are not growing properly. And we are really very lucky um, that relapses, when you look at the number of relapses, and this is based on our own statistics, and, and, um, and we will talk a little bit more about that um, uh, later in the lecture, in the talk. Um, you can see relapses are very common in the first year of life. Then by the second year, it goes a little bit down, third year, fourth year, fifth year, and usually by five or six years, the number of relapses decrease very much. And actually the number for us in our statistics is about 5%. So after six years, there's about 5% of patients that might still tie it up because those muscles still are a little bit tight. And, and, um, and so the reason for saying, use the brace until four or five is because that way you can cut 90 to 95% of the relapses uh, that you will see in your clinic. And, and why relapses grow? Well. Uh, happen? Well, you have a muscle and soft tissues that are a little stiffer than normal. And you have a bone, as we described, 
that has absolutely zero problems growing. The growth plates are growing normally and making the leg longer. And those muscles also has to grow. It's not that you stretch them, it's that they have to grow. And if they are a little bit um, stiffer, they will need more energy for growth. So this, the, the main factor for muscle growth in childhood is stretching. If you don't stretch the muscles, those muscles are not going to grow at the same rate that the bone is growing. And that is why relapses happen. So relapses in clubfoot has nothing to do with the foot. So thinking about how do I cut the foot, if I cut this ligament or the other one, if I lengthen this muscle or not, has absolutely nothing to do with the real cause of clubfoot, which is an abnormal, it's literally a slower growth of the muscles. But if you keep those muscles stretched properly as, as with the energy that they require for growth, then those muscles will grow better and then you won't see relapses. And I think this is critical for understanding clubfoot and for understanding the treatment of clubfoot because the Ponsetti method really is not a casting technique. The Ponsetti method is a philosophy. It's an understanding of clubfoot and how do you approach clubfoot with the concepts of Ponsetti. And the muscles that are the most important are the muscles in the posterior aspect of the leg, no question. So uh, in a normal biomechanic study of the uh, hind foot, how the foot moves and the hind foot moves, we know that the, the peroneus longus and brevis are evertors, it brings the foot out and it's a little bit of help by the extensors. Now, everybody thinks that the posterior tip and the anterior tip are the strongest muscles inverting the foot. But the stronger muscle inverting the foot five times more is the soleus. Because the soleus has a biomechanical advantage because it goes to the tip of the calcaneus and just a little shortening on the soleus is five times more lever arm than the posterior tip. So relapses happen because the muscles start getting behind, they don't grow as much, and especially because the soleus, which is a very kind of interesting muscle, uh, start getting shorter unless you keep stretching and you have to stretch in dorsiflexion for the, for the, uh, for the soleus. So the only way to get the soleus to be stretched is if you keep the soleus in dorsiflexion. And so a smaller amount of uh, decreased growth in the soleus increases by five times compared with the other ones. So relapses are not initially driven by the anterior tip or the posterior tip. Relapses are driven by mostly the soleus not growing properly. And, and, and this is critical. And the key here is that this abnormality in the development of the limb stays with the life of the patient. In this MRI from the work of Hippolyto, you can see here how the leg in this adult person, and he was treated with the Ponsetti method uh, after Dr. Um, Hippolyto went back to Rome, that the size of the muscles is half of the size of the normal side. Functionally, most people have no problems, but it's clear that this abnormality in the limb development and growth on, on, on clubfoot is abnormal. So this is why it's extremely important for people to understand that clubfoot is not a foot problem. Clubfoot is the result of a developmental abnormality of the limb affecting the muscles and soft tissues that by differential growth compared with the bones, pull the foot into the club foot position. So club foot is really not a diagnosis. Club foot is just a symptom and the symptom of a developmental abnormality of the leg. And if you don't understand this, 
you are going to make wrong decisions because you are going to concentrate your treatment in the food. And how do I put it straight when the real abnormality is in the leg? And if you keep those muscles nice and stretched, the foot is going to be just in the right position with a no problem. And this is critical to understand. So as we discussed, the Ponsetti method is really not a casting technique. The Ponsetti method is actually, what I will say is a philosophy. You know, it has a very specific way of manipulating, a very specific way of doing the casting, which is what most people understand. Um, but it's a very specific way also preventing relapses, which is our topic today, and treating these relapses. As it's been said, most people feel comfortable doing the casting and getting the foot straight, um, more or less. And then people are facing the problem of relapses. But if you understand why this happened and you understand the muscle development, then you can actually understand the treatment of clubfoot and the clubfoot relapses. The key here is that the principles of the Ponsetti method are very, very simple. Really, this is, you know, you know, he was a genius on, on, on coming up with this method. And, and, the, and the principles are just three. I mean, really, you apply these principles to every single case of clubfoot, you are going to be successful. Number one, either for a one day old baby or for a 10 years old kid without relapse or for a 15 years old person that never been treated, a neglected case, what you need to do first is stretch those muscles with your casting to get correction. Because you have to stretch those muscles to get correction. It's not cutting ligaments what is going to get correction. You have to get dorsiflexion uh, because that's usually the last step. And you can try that to do with casting, but that puts a lot of pressure on the um, talus, especially, and you can create uh, iatrogenic deformity, which is a flat talus. And for those, you do a tenotomy. And then you maintain the correction. Once you have the foot corrected, means you have a stretch all the soft tissues and muscles and tendons, then you have to maintain that correction. And that correction is maintained by bracing. And after the age of usually four or five, then if in those five to 10% of the kids that still there's a tendency for those muscles to, um, to uh, tie it up with growth because they are still not quite flexible, then you can add a tibialis anterior transfer. But this is very critical. The anterior tibial transfer is not to correct a relapse. The anterior transfer is to maintain the correction that you are doing with your casting and tenotomy. And this is critical to understand because I see a lot of cases and, and I know that um, Monica and, and Christoph see a lot of cases of patients that have been treated and they have done a tibial tendon transfer and they keep relapsing and they have a relapse. And, 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 and so, because they didn't do casting before they didn't correct the deformity. So this is very, very important and very simple. Any deformity you stretch and cast, you get dorsiflexion and then you maintain with something, a brace or anterior tendon transfer. And with that, you can use it at any age. Now, it's very important also to think, and, and I think this is critical, that we all want to get from that to that. You want to get a kid that is born with club foot to a normal looking, flexible, not painful, uh, normal, almost normal in function uh, foot. And, and we all have two instruments to do that. We have our knowledge, and then we have our hand, and then we have a knife, or we have a plaster cast. Okay, and the problem that I see in many places today is that when you decide to go with the surgery, 
you know, you require a very special environment. You need an OR, you need a specialized pediatric uh, anesthesiologist, you need an assistant, you need an instrument person that knows what he's doing, you need another nurse around. I mean, you need a team of four or five people besides the people in the pre-op and the post-op and then in the floor, right? And you don't dare to do this, to correct this deformity through surgery without that. And what happened frequently, more frequently than one would think, and I think this is one of the, uh, of those, you know, difficult to understand situations in medicine is that when you use the also very powerful instrument, which is the CAS, because it's messy and it's just CAS, I mean, it's like, oh, it's CAS, then it's done by the resident or the nurse or the physical therapist or somebody. So surgery is only done by associate professor up. Casting can be done by anyone. And the problem with that approach and with that really mistake, because what you are doing is treating clubfoot, no matter what instrument you use, and your knowledge and skill are so more important with one or the other. One has a set of problems and complications, the other one also has a set of problems and complications and results. If you don't spend and use the same detail with the casting as you do with your surgery, you are not going to be successful. And this is critical because this is, I think, one of the major issues that I see today um, globally is to minimize the value of the casting as an instrument to correct this deformity. And I think that is a, a wrong concept in the orthopedic community. I will say, and I will argue that casting is probably as, if not more challenging to correct 100% of the kids than knife. Because with a knife, you can correct anything. You just can more or cut less. But with casting, it's much more difficult. And you just start getting into swelling and, and sores and everything. It's just very, very, very hard. So um, it requires this mindset and don't minimize. Actually, I think you have to make sure that the method is, you know, and the, and the technique is properly done. And this is, goes not only for just a baby, but this goes for any case any neglected case or any relapse at any age. So it's a teamwork. And as we were discussing, relapses is the most difficult thing that we see today. And as the poll show, it's because of not complying with the brace. And as orthopedic surgeons, as you know, as the, Dr. Ha um, Deren, um, Deren said, we are blaming the parents. No, it's the fault of the parents. You know, we are not in fault, it's the parents' fault. And, and that is a big problem. And it's true, it's happened that way. But it happened that way because the parents have not understood the treatment and have not understood the, uh, the, uh, that they are part of the team. So when you see the baby in the first day of, of, of your visit, and then you start your casting, Instead of letting the parents to sit in, in the corner in two chairs and mom is almost crying and, and then you are doing this or maybe even your residents doing this and the kids crying and then every week you come back and they come back and they happen the same thing. You know, those parents psychologically are, it's very hard for them to understand, you know, that they are part of the treatment and, 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 and they have the most difficult part of the treatment, which is the bracing. So from day one, you have to get the parents to be part of the team. And they are the best persons to anesthetize the kid. They have to, to keep the kid nice and, 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 and relaxed because it's very difficult to do casting, either in a baby or in a one-year-old or one and a half kicking around because they are so excited. And they are the best to keep the kids calm. And so when they do that, and they are part of the team, they um, internalize the treatment and, and, and the outcomes. And that's the best way, and really the only way to keep these families using the brace until the age of five. If you don't do so, you are going to 
continue having problems of compliance. And the compliance is not coming from the parents, it's also coming from you, because you have not been able to make these parents understand the treatment completely. And that's why the Ponseri method is not just a casting technique. This is the whole uh, interaction with the parents. The kids are not tri finished treatment until they are 18 and they finish. You know, you see this all the time in every place. Short cast, cast that fail, no molding at all. You know, just put a, you know, something in the leg to see if you can stretch this thing. And I see this all the time. And I'm supposed that you also see this uh, um, in your practices. Um, and, and, and so then it's like, well, this foot is very rigid. It's not responding to the Ponseti. We need to go back to surgery, right? And then this is all kind of problems that you are going to see, especially with rocker bottom deformities. You know, and you do an x-ray, the talus will be absolutely flat. And then you get into this swelling complex kind of situation with feet like these ones over here, that is like, how, you know, how can you get to that from a kid that is so nice and soft? Well, this is a huge complication. And if you think about this and you look at the MRI of the cases with, with swelling, you are killing, you're creating almost a compartment syndrome in this feed. And, and that's why they don't respond to the treatment. So this is very, very important to understand. And, and why I say this? Well, in this systematic review of uh, the management of clubfoot um, by Chao Li Group in China, um, what they observe in clinical variations is like, oh, in my cases, no, in India, no, in Brazil, no, in Austria, no, in Iowa, uh, the feet are not different. What is different is how do you apply the method? How much detail you put into your casting? How much detail you put into your bracing? How much coaching do you do to your families? And how do you, you know, uh, manage relapses? And, and, and the truth is that when you do the method properly, when you follow the guidelines, then the results are amazing. And, and this was demonstrated in this paper, um, the group of Matt Dobbs and the group in Denver here in the United States. In Denver, big children hospital, 16 orthopedic surgeons, uh, probably there are more now, they are very busy. Um, and then Matt Dobbs, you know, he has a clubfoot clinic uh, um, uh, dedicated uh, to clubfoot. And the 16 orthopedic surgeons, you know, they will adapt the method to their understanding and to their practice. And so when they put the two together, what they realize that is in, in Denver, they have a 50 to 60% surgery rate compared to no surgery with the with Matt Dobbs applying the method properly. And this is including extensive releases and so forth. So is how do you apply the method through the life of the kid is extremely important. And I can overemphasize this, this fact. It's not the feet. The genetic plays a role, as we saw, and they were right. The bracing plays a role. Correcting the foot completely plays a role. Not using the brace plays a role, huge. But this is all under your responsibility. Now, we did a study a couple of years ago. Uh, we asked the POSNA members, and we did a poll similar to what you did this morning. Okay, and I'm so happy that the poll this morning in India is much better than the poll that was done in the United States with the POSNA members. Because what we found uh, when we asked about the treatment of relapses is that only 34% of the people recommend the brace until four. And when they have a relapse and relapses were present up to 40% of the time in, most, in many, many cases, half of the people didn't do casting, which is critical. You have to correct the deformity with cast before you do maintenance. And because you don't do that, and you go to do the, the anterior tendon transfer, the foot is not corrected. It's like, oh, we have to do something. And so surgical releases in this country are still done in almost half of the patients for relapses. And this is really outrageous, really, I would say. There was a paper by Science and the group in which 
the United States, as you know, they have we have CPT codes for every operation we do, and then we have, as you do probably, and then we have the ICD-9 now ICD-10 for disease. So you cross two, you know, class with ICD um, and 10, and then you cross the codes because here is all insurance companies and they pay you by the codes really. Um, then this is all going to databases and there's one database for um, a representation of all the children hospitals in the country, okay? And Liu took a look of this uh, early on and look at the number of surgeries um, in Clafood uh, from 96 to 2006. Remember uh, the first course uh, of uh, Ponseti method here in Iowa was in 1999. And, and so by 2000, you can see here that after 2000, when a few people in the United States start being trained, the number of surgeries over the next five, six years went down 85%. Now, this is surgeries in the first year of life. Okay, so, so it really tells you that by doing a good casting technique, you can really reduce the number of cases. It should be zero uh, if you do it correctly. I have not done any surgery, posterior release or nothing in, in uh, idiopathic club food in, or here in Iowa for 30 years. So you can correct all the cases. I mean, some of them might take you 14 cash, but but you can all turn it around. You can stretch those tissues slowly, um, uh, but can be turned around. Now we follow this study because our experience here in Iowa is that it was not that pretty. And, and what happened is that when we use the same database and we went to 2012 and now 2016, and we are just finishing up those statistics. So this is uh, still not impressed, uh, but I wanted to share with you. Uh, in black is the first year of life. And definitely, actually, there's a 92% reduction up to 2016 of surgery cases in Clafoot in this country. But the number of surgeries after one year of age is practically the same. And this is why, you know, when you put this together with the POSNA membership uh, questionnaire on relapses, that people just keep doing surgeries. And, and this is a big problem. And the type of surgeries that are done, and this is actual data. I mean, these are real hard data in the United States. It's exactly the same than before the Ponseti method in 1997. And, and look at here one for external fixation, a peak at the edge of two. I mean, why do you have to do an external fixation in a two years old kid that has a relapse. I mean, it's like, how, how'd that come? And, and doing osteotomies, you know, from, from two years of age. There's absolutely no need for that because it's not a problem of the food, it's a problem of soft tissue. You have to stretch those soft tissues and maintain and stretch. So this is a big issue. It's still in the United States. And I think this is probably the same that you are seeing um, in India and other countries. And um, and, and, you know, this is pretty cool. You know, so we are pediatric, I'm a pediatric orthopedist. And then surgeon is kind of in quotes, but there are many pediatric orthopedic surgeons. And because you are a surgeon, you have to use your skills. And, and then doing surgery in Clafford is pretty cool because it's kind of nice and, you know, delicate and, 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 you know, and then you get the foot turned around and it's beautiful. It's like, and you feel great about, you know, your work. The problem is that when you look at the data and you look at until the patient is 18 years of age, which is when it's going to finish the growth, many patients by that time require three or four more surgeries. And I, I bet you that you have experience of cases that have five, six, seven, ten 10 surgeries because you know, those feet are not very good. And the number of complications increments and increases with more surgeries, right? And then you have under corrections, you have over corrections. And I can tell you over correction in Clafu like this, and probably your experience, these are painful, really painful. So, so if you will look at the data and, and this is clinical based evidence, okay? Not opinion experts, opinion. This is not tradition. You know, you base your decision-making in, um, in evidence, 
these papers here, and sorry, it's a bit small, but I can share with you, it's in the internet. Uh, in blue is the uh, long-term outcomes of patients with after surgery. In red is the patients treated with Ponseti. And you can see here that when you do a follow-up and it's a two or three year follow-up on the kids are 10 to 15, most of the patients in these three or four papers, there's not too many, are doing pretty good. In general, they are okay. But once they reach maturity, 18 to 20, then the numbers goes down. And the last one, the longest follow-up is 30 year follow-up, 27 by the group of DOPS in San Luis, in which only 30% of the patients were doing okay, non-excellent, some good 30%, and then the rest were fair or poor. And the key here in this paper is that um, they combined only posterior releases and posterior media releases done in infancy when the kids were, you know, six months, 10 months or something, because the results were the same. So no minimal surgery. I open a little bit in the back to get a little bit more dosiflexion. In the long term, it has all the same effect based on this paper that if you do a posterior media release. Because once you lock the calcaneus on moving and there's no dorsiflexion or um, inversion aversion because the scar in the back, the re functional results are the same. Would you compare that with the red line, which is the Ponseti treatment, treatment patients, which are the Dr. Ponseti treatment back in the 50s, they stay in the 80 to 90% excellent or good results with a few fair and only four or five that have pain. So this is the dramatic, the dramatic difference when you are thinking about doing surgery in a patient with a club foot that we call. And the key here is that when you look at the same patients and you look at their quality of life, and this is a very important study that component that uh, Dr. Dobbs and the group did to use a quality questionnaire, not, nothing related with foot and ankle pain or scores or nothing. It's like, so how these people are doing in life? I mean, an SF36 is a questionnaire used for any disease to see the quality, to assess the quality of life of patients. In a normal person is 50 plus minus three. We did the same on the Ponseri three patients and this is a 50 year follow-up and it's 49. So people are 50, average 50, they are just doing fine like any other people. But 30 years old that were treated with surgery when they were kids and then a few more surgeries after that, the majority of them had a quality of life of 33 points, which compares to chronic hair failure or Parkinson's disease in people with 60 or 70 years old. So these 30 years old people can do nothing. That is what this means. Because if they do something, they are going to hurt for a week. So they just decrease their level of activity to tolerance. But that is affecting their quality of life because they cannot play tennis, they cannot play football, they cannot do anything, or they cannot be hiking with their friends or nothing. And this is dramatic because these are 30 years old people. I mean, you are 60 or 70 and you can do hiking, it's okay. But at 30, I mean, that is really dramatically affecting and it's not going to get better on these patients. It's going to probably get worse. So, so when you are thinking about treating club food and you are thinking about doing anything that involves the joints and the ligaments and lengthening of tendons and producing more scar, please think again and think about these papers because you are setting that patient to a life of really almost disability. So what is the experience in Iowa about relapses. And this is, uh, um, this is a really interesting actual experience. Um, so there are many papers out there. Uh, many papers show huge amount of relapses as we were discussing. Uh, the most recent one by Science actually, he, re he reported a relapse rate of 68%, which is like, oh my. Uh, but there are many problems with these papers. One is that they are usually small cohorts, you know, just 10, 15, 20 patients. Um, one of the issues is that in many places, 
is not the orthopedic surgeon, the one doing the casting and treating the patient, but other people, other providers, nurses or cast technicians or residents and so forth, which we can argue that maybe those cases are not as good as they should be. It's clear that this deviation from the Ponseti method as we discussed, and, and there's a very quick going to surgery as we have seen in the data uh, here in this country. And, and most of these papers have no long-term follow-up. It's just a few years. And we know that in the first 10 or 15 years, you know, most people do fine no matter what you do. So, so we look at all the patients treated by Dr. Ponseri and myself here in the University of Iowa. Um, we stop at 13, so, and, and the study is underway, it's almost done. So the patients will have at least five or six years follow-up. Uh, we have a, a thousand patients, and this is not taking in account complex cleft with this are idiopathic cleft. They might have had some treatment, but they were not in the complex category, okay? And so 15, almost 1600 feet with more than five year follow-up. Statistically, you can see two to three more frequent in males and half bilateral, half right and left. So interestingly, over 65 years, we got exactly the same statistics that other people have in, in, in other series. Um, with respect to relapse, in all these years, two things to, um, to make clear, no compliant with the brace is the key. And we, in 65 years, have a 12% relapse rate. And I think we work really, really hard to get to this level. And, and you might be able to lower down and, you know, and that is great. And we try to lower this down, but it's kind of difficult to go down more than, you know, 10, 15% because there are families that have difficulties in life and, and they need a lot of help. Um, but if you are looking at the data and, and say, you know, how can I do this the best? Well, if you are in the 10, 15% relapse rate, um, you know, you are doing very well. And that means that your bracing, your period of bracing is working properly. Now, not using the brace is for sure a problem. And that is the main reason for relapses. Now, in the patients that have prior treatment, we have a little higher relapse rate, almost 20%. And I think that's related to problems with the casting that is affecting the development of the muscles. And those muscles have even less flexibility because probably they have a little bit more fibrosis. And, and so they grow a little slower. And then you are going to see some, a few more relapses, but still is a manageable number. There was no difference statistically uh, but there's for sure those cases you have to keep watching and trying to get the family to go as long as they can with the bracing. Um, age at the presentation, as I said, previous treatment, five or seven days, no difference. And even the number of casts for correction at the beginning has no difference. So if one case needs um, five casts, another one 10, if you get them corrected properly, and you keep the bracing using properly, the relapse rate is control. Okay. And just to uh, point it out, um, because this is, I think is very important from the technical part of the casting, only 8%, 7.8% of all these patients in 65 years require more than seven casts. So when you are thinking about clubfoot, and this is idiopathic, I'm not talking arthrogryposis or myelomeningocele. These are just normal kids. The one that we know is an idiopathic club food. The only thing they have is, uh, is a club food, right? Um, there's no much difference in these cases. 92% of them were corrected with five or six cars. Actually, our average is 5.3. So when you are thinking about club food and you are blaming the food because you are not able to correct them or you get too much swelling, you have to be very humble and realize that your casting technique or the way the casting is done in your clinic is probably not properly. And, and I think this is critical for people to understand. So how do you approach relapses? Um, well, we are in a very special, you know, very tricky time. You know, we are in a pandemic and it's happening there and it's happening in every single country. 
We have this virus thing that is killing the economies and is really making a huge impact in every one of us and in our lives and the life of everybody that we know. Now, as a doctor, you know, what you want is not to end up with thousands and thousands and thousands or millions of people in the ICU, which is super expensive and many of the people don't make it and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people dying what you want is to prevent that from happening by just using the mask, relatively social distance, and hopefully at some point you we will get a, a vaccine and then things will get better, right? So the treatment here is not to be very complicated and I'm an ICU doctor and I'm great and I'm going to save the life of this person, is like you don't want people to get infected. Well, in relapses, in Clubfoot is exactly the same. Relapses is not treatment or relapses. Relapses is prevention, prevention, and prevention. That's how you treat Clubfoot. You are not treating to see what kind of surgery or technique or whether you cut or not cut and how you put the foot and the pins. What you want in Clubfoot, when you are using the Ponsetti method philosophy, is I want to prevent relapses and I don't want to do any surgery in any kit. So if I can go down to 0% TBLS anterior transfer, that will be the best. You won't be able to do that and you won't be able to get 0% relapses, but the lower, the better. So this is key. So this is the real Ponsetti method. Anything else is not. And I think this is extremely important for everybody to understand. And because we are talking about relapses and we are talking about prevention of relapses, then what is the most important component and the principles for the brace? Well, the most important component and principle for the brace, besides that you put the affected side on 60 and 30 and you bend the bar and so forth, the key embracing, the key embracing is comfortable shoes. That's the key. And a little baby, two months old, of a one year old, of a five years old, if you don't use a comfortable shoe, that kid is not going to be using the brace. And it's your responsibility, every one of you out there, and I don't know how many you are, but everyone is your responsibility as the doctor to provide the families with the most comfortable brace that is in your market. And if there is no one, you have to find one because that's the key for success. You cannot just write a prescription, send it to the orthotic people and say, make a brace for this patient and come back in three months and see that the kid has sores and they are not using the brace. The family hates the thing. And, and the kid doesn't want to use it, and then you are in relapses. You as the doctor are responsible for giving this family, which, and this kid, who is your responsibility to get to 18 years old without problems, the brace that has the most comfortable shoes. That's the key, because the other things are just technical. 60 degrees here, 30 degrees there, bending the bar or no bending the bar. And I can overemphasize how important this is. So please, when you are now back in your clinic tomorrow, you look at what are the options you have and you start looking for one option that provides those parents with the most comfortable shoes for the kids so they can be successful with you. That's the way you treat relapses, is preventing them by using a brace that is comfortable. There's no other way around, really no other way around. And there are many ways and there are many shoes out there and many braces done by many people. And I would say that if you will have a kid with club foot and you have to use some of these braces out here, it will last two weeks for you and your wife to get desperate because your kid, and just think about one, your kids, your kid, your son or your daughter, using these things for four or five years. There's no way unless they are comfortable. And 
what type of race is also very important, right? And you need to stretch those muscles. That's the function of the brace. The function of the brace is not to hold the foot. And that's why this concept of club foot is not the best concept that we can use. It's a developmental normality and you have to stretch those muscles because the foot is going to follow what the muscles are saying. And so the key here is that the kid should be free every day during the day running because that's the best exercise for those muscles to grow. And then at night when those muscles are relaxed and also when the kids grow, which is at night physically they grow, then you have a brace that is stretching those muscles. And the key one, besides the posterior T, anterior T, and flexors, which you require abduction, is the soleus. And the brace is not holding the foot. It's not something to hold the foot in position. The brace is something that is dynamic that allows the kid to be moving and stretching through the night when they are moving around. So any AFO, any plastic that you put during the day or at night is affecting the development of those muscles. So you don't need anything, no inserts, no nothing. Just let the kid grow and, and run as much as possible because the more they run, the better it's going to be the muscle development and the elasticity. In this study, this was an investigation for a PhD and they developed this model. And in a nutshell, here um, in the top is the standard brace. I hope that you can see it. And you can see that all the muscles are stretched other than the peroneals and the anterior tip, because if you keep the foot in abduction, the peroneals don't get stretched, they shorten a little. And, and the anterior tip also is a little off the axis of movement. If you use an AFO, Yes, you stretch a little bit up to 90 degrees, but you are not doing dorsiflexion. And if you do dorsiflexion, you start having a relapse. And then if you use the articulated brace, uh, the dos bar specifically in this study, um, because the dos bar has too much flexibility and it can go in plantar flexion. Yes, it stretches the posterior tip and the flexors and the anterior tip so on but it doesn't stretch the soleus as much because the kid can overcome the flexion. And so it's not as effective in this model as for the stretching the feet. And another thing is very important, and this is a paper from Norway, is that um, if you use an AFO at night, it's like, okay, during the day the kid is running, but at night we are going to put a, a brace to do dorsiflexion and a little bit abduction. So this is a model that is very um, much in use in the Northern uh, um, Europe, uh, Norway, Sweden, Germany, and in many other places. And here in the United States is called the Witton brace and probably you have other names. So it's an it's a articulated AFO with, with the knee also included the thigh. And then you have these straps and well, when you are doing that for 10 to 12 hours for five years in a kid, what is happening is all those pressures and, and, and you are not allowing like in the standard brace for the kid to be moving because the brace is not holding the foot in position. It's just allowing the muscles to stretch in the right direction, which is different. Then the number of flat talus is, you know, mild, moderate and severe is 90%. So if you put a brace putting pressure on that talus by using this kind of brace, you are flattening the talus. And you flatten the talus, this person is never, ever, ever going to have dorsiflexion in that foot. It will be neutral or less. And you are going to be fighting even more the growth of the muscles until the patient is 18. So the best brace biomechanically and the best brace functionally based on this information is a foot abduction brace that allows the kid to move around without any pressure with the most comfortable shoes that can be done for that kid. And that's the way you prevent relapses. So how to enhance compliance? 
Well, number one, make it fun. Don't think that the braces are a punishment. Don't let the families from day one to think that this is a punishment. This is a very positive thing to keep your kid out of trouble. They need to have the tools to be good. And if you recommend a brace that is so painful because it's so hard or doesn't fit or something and the foot is not fully corrected and on and on and on, those parents are not going to be successful. I don't know if there are parents that don't want the kid to be successful and be fine. It's your responsibility. And, and, and understand where are the problems. Sometimes they have another kid, mom, you know, uh, is, is pregnant and, and, and then they have three kids and, and the father is working very hard and, and they are with grandma and grandma feels so bad because you have to put the brace in the baby, oh poor baby, something. I mean, these are, these are real issues and, but you are the doctor and it's your responsibility to talk to the parents and make them sure that they understand this. And they do, if you are a coach for them. And I think the best position for you as a doctor to prevent relapses is to be a coach, like the coach of the football team. There will be bad days and then you have to regroup and there will be very good days and you have to tell the parents how well they are doing when they come back to clinic because they need that, right? And, and relapses happen clinically, now getting more technical. Remember, there is this muscle development issue. So the sign of a relapse is that you start losing dorsiflexion because that gastrosolus is getting tight, okay? There's no relapses caused by dynamic supination of the anterior tip. Very few, five in my cases, very few. They are always have tightness because that's the muscle growth of the whole leg. Remember in that MRI that the anterior tip was tiny, little, and with the MRI characteristics of you know, having fibrosis or, or, or fat in between or something. So the anterior tip is not super dynamic here. It's not super strong, actually. It's just the same as the other muscles. It's a stiff. So always look for how much dorsiflexion and abduction you have on the feet. And when you start getting a relapse, besides losing dorsiflexion, what that means is the calcaneus start going into plantar flexion. When it does that, Biomechanically, you remember from Dr. Ponseri functional anatomy studies, it start turning in and going plantar flexion and inversion. So that start giving you the virus and it start giving you the adductors of the foot, no metatarsus adductors, adductors of the foot. And then eventually the foot will start developing a little bit of cables. So in the early stages of a relapse, you might only see a little bit of loss of dorsiflexion if it is more time between stopping the brace and when you see the patient, those muscles are going to tighten up more over the growth of the patient and there's going to be more deformity and the kid will start walking on the outside of the foot. Like in this case, this kid is a four or five years old kid and he came six or seven months after stopping the brace and, uh, and you can see here that it has a little virus, it start developing a little bit of cables, um, the foot is turning in, and here we don't examine the dorsiflexion, but there's no dorsiflexion. So that is how a relapse happened, is because all those muscles over a period of time, the bone keeps growing, they get behind, they start getting tight, and then they start making the foot to turn in. So, how do you treat relapses then? Well, it's the same thing. Number one, you stretch those tissues by casting. The same thing that you did when the newborn baby was baby. And then you do a tenotomy or not, depending if you can stretch them completely. So if the relapse is kind of uh, not too advanced, um, then you might be able with two or three casts to get dorsiflexion. And, and then you go back to the brace. If it is very, very stiff or the patient came when it was a baby and then they don't show up until one and a half years and then the foot is almost the same as the original deformity, then you just follow the problem. You just do the casting, do the tenotomy, get to 10 to 15 degrees dorsiflexion and then go to the brace until the age of four or five. And if you do that, 
90 to 95% of the patients don't have a relapse. And that's the way to treat relapses. And after the age of four or five, if it is very difficult for those patients to, uh, to uh, usually is because they are old enough and they learn how to take the shoes and so forth, then after you correct the deformity with casting, then you do a tenotomy and anterior tendon transfer on um, at the same time. And that is the treatment for relapses in those 5% after four um, in general. Now, I would like to ask with this part, what will be the opinion of the panel about this case? Um, he was 10, uh, 9, 11, and he had five casts and tenotomy done by Dr. Ponseri. Uh, the family used the brace until three, so not too bad. They start noticing that it was to start getting tight by five or six. They didn't have insurance, which is uh, unfortunately common in our country. And he presented a 10 with this deformity. And let me go to the lateral side. So he was walking like that at the age of nine. So I would like to ask um, the, uh, the panel, what would be um, their approach uh, on this case? Okay, let's start with the Indian faculty first. Uh, the Viraj, you being uh, youngest of the expert, what will be your opinion? Yeah, uh, I would still like to go ahead with, uh, uh, as Dr. Joe's mentioned, uh, some casting, and if uh, the uh, and some kind of uh, mini invasive procedure like uh, for curry, because there is a lot of cavus. If you see, the cavus is still there, so cavus has recurred. So maybe percutaneous plantar fasciotomy, and then uh, followed by the tenotomy and the same setting. And if it is required. Uh, I may go ahead with uh, um, some kind of osteotomy like, like Lishbla or Ivan's, like some uh, maybe a simple cuboid wedge dissection if it is not responding to the uh, um, casting alone. So that okay, for how bad. many cast you will wait uh, before you go for the osteotomy? Um, considering this child is 10 year old, I think um, maybe around uh, three or four or maybe four or five should be sufficient, not more than that. With considering the amount of deformity what uh, the child has. Okay. Um, Monica, what will be your uh, take for this? How will you manage? Well, I know this case, so it's not fair. <laughs> but <laughs> I think the most important thing to consider is that if you go on Ponsetti method again, you have to be sure that you are making progress. I think this is crucial on the grown-ups or neglected, abandoned cases uh, after walking age or relapsed. You have to be sure that you, you have a control of, of how your cats are abducting, how much they are abducting, uh, and if you got stuck in something. So that, one, you can revise your technique and improve and get going, or you stop and do something else. But to remember this case has no uh, previous uh, release, Please, has no yeah. uh, other incisions. Absolutely. So things must be good if you go on Ponseri. I think you have a, a tremendous uh, advantage than not ha having uh, messing, messed with all the structures and you should get stretched uh, if you if you go well with the Ponseti. So I won't, I won't say because I know the case, but, but just go for it and control if you're doing uh, good progress. I think that that's the clue. Yes, uh, John, uh, for your yes. opinion. But before that, how many number of blasters do you anticipate in this case at the age of 10? Because parents will usually ask like, how many blasters we have to come? So what will be your answer or explanation to them? Yeah, Monica, what will be your explanation oh, to... Uh, well, you have to tell family because they have to plan for treatment, okay? So uh, you, I, will get, I will throw six as a good number because that's more or less the number of the babies. So give, <laughs> the family has to give you six weeks and let's see what happens. <clears throat> and if everything is very, very good, what happens if you have to go one more, one or two more, and you finished, or you you 
ready for tenotomy and anterior tip transfer, it's a good thing. But you have to make a plan. If you get uh, stuck on some number of casts, that's not bad. You have to revise, see what's going on, and, and replan or ask for help. Both, both opinions are OK. And I think you have to get, give the family some you know, instructions. So, OK, let me have this uh, protocol for this one and a half month or maybe two if they are from far away. And they and, and you see what's going on and you document and this way you can you can see if you're making progress. Okay, uh, but uh, then they usually ask in our country, uh, what will be the success rate? So uh, of the treatment which you are offering. So what will be your say uh, to that? Like how would you promise to uh, the family about the result? Well, you have to tell them that you're treating the food. So if you get, you have to be ready to get. It. I think this sound is not great. It's very important. Most people start those three without having this. Uh, sorry. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so spicy. you have to be to be sure that hospital is available. Hospital okay, uh, is available. This is a way that you can do pulsatio method only if you can or not. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, John. What would you like uh, tell so the family? So I would certainly. I, I I think I more or less agree with what Monica said. Is that certainly would try casting again. And again, go the same way because supination again is a question of uh, getting the the uh, sort of cavus is a question of supinating the forefoot so that it comes in line with the hind foot, okay? And then do your casting the classical way. And obviously, you need to see the progress. You can't say every one of them will do well, but we've done quite a few older kids up to the age of 12, 13 with uh, Ponseti casting, and especially if they've not had major surgery before like poster, uh, posterior medial releases, etc. It still works quite well. Okay. So go the same way, maybe more castings may be necessary. You may need eight or 10 castings sometime. But if you're progressing in your first four or five casts, then I would continue doing that and go on. With that. Okay. And yes, Christoph, what will be your uh, take for this? Like anything different than what Monica said or the Viraj or the John said? I think most things have been said. I, I think a very important point is the quality of previous treatment. So if there was no surgery before, if, if it was uh, casted well, then you can expect uh, a very good result from recasting. Uh, I think one important fact is uh, sometimes, I mean, you really need to, to palpate the foot and to feel the foot. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's difficult to say from the pictures. Some feet like this, they might only need like three casts or something. And some feet might be more stiff. Uh, but I think then in the end, you really need to, to, to look at the result of your casting before you think about a percutaneous fasciotomy of, of, of the plantar fascia or if you need a, a transfer or not. Okay. Yes, uh, Jaws, uh, before you uh, show us the result, uh, one question uh, by the participants. Is there a role of physiotherapy in this case? Um, not really. Uh, I mean, you, you can, if they are during the bracing time, there's no need because there are 10 hours of a stretch by the brace. Um, right. they, I, I think there might be a role uh, when the patient stops the bracing around five. Um, to get into the habit of doing stretching exercises, mostly for the Achilles tendon. And, and so learning with a therapist how to do that and control from time to time. But there's no, I don't think there's a need for, in general, for formal physical therapy. Um, usually I recommend a home therapy program. Uh, so the patient learn the exercises and then they do it at home. And then every so often they go to therapy to see you know, if things are okay. Okay, then there was a very important question by Tariq Singh. He has asked that how a 10-year-old child can tolerate a MOD plaster? 
Um, well, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, you know, actually, the, one of the issues here is what kind of um, how high the plaster goes. If you go below the knee or you go above the knee, okay, in relapses. Um, if there's only some tightness of the heel core and a little bit of cables, not too much, and the foot is, you can get the foot to neutral or even 10 degrees abduction. So it's a kind of early relapse. You can use short leg cast, let the key walk. And, and usually with that, you are able to stretch the foot nicely with probably two or three casts at the most and go back to the brace. Um, in, in cases in which the deformity is, is, um, has more stiffness, and, or in this case, um, long leg cast works better because you can hold the foot uh, as you are progressing on your abduction. You don't need to go to the groin. Um, you just go just a little bit above the knee. Uh, you can let the knee, instead of 90 degrees, like 60 or something, so they can still walk. Uh, it's no question that it's really, it's kind of difficult for the kids and the families. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, but, but when you put it on the whole scheme, uh, anything that you will be doing, they are going to be for three months in casting or, or fixator or something anyway. So, so it, doesn't, it doesn't make it much longer than, than that. Okay, and is there a role of Botox, botulinum injection in uh, this by weakening the gastrosoleus muscle? Do we get a faster okay. correction? Um, so, so this is a question that, uh, you know, you have to think about the pathology again, okay? Mm. And that's why I started with half of the uh, presentation on understanding club food. Club food is not an spastic foot. Club food is that the muscles are tighter. They have some fibrosis building, right? So what it makes the muscles to not to have enough flexibility is not a spasticity because the nerve is sending too much uh, signal to these muscles. It's because they are stiffer. So if you use Botox, it's not going to do anything because Botox is not going to treat that fibrosis, right? So there's no, I don't think there's absolutely no role because Botox is for um, inhibiting, you know, blocking the neurovascular, the neuromuscular junction, uh, which in these cases, the rest of the muscle is completely stiff, right? So, so it has, in my opinion, it has no value. Okay. Then there was, uh, before you show us the, what you did, there was another question. Is there a role of x-rays, radiology, to evaluate the deformity, or it's just on a clinical ground uh, we evaluate the deformity? Um, I mean, I, I, I you know, uh, I think you can do x-rays, like in this case, uh, you know, I, might, I think you can do x-rays just in case. We know the story because it was one of our patients. We know that he had just regular club food and used the brace and we saw him when he was maybe three or four and he was doing okay. So it's not like, you know, you know that there might be some weird fusion or something because he was fine. If it's a patient that comes from somewhere for me, like this patient comes from somewhere and shows up the first day in my clinic, then most likely I will do an x-ray. I mean, the x-ray is mostly to rule out any you know, like fusion or something here, but this is a soft tissue problem. Remember, I mean, this is the key of the whole presentation. This is not in the bones. The bones have, are moving uh, depending on how the muscles are pulling them. And, and so you took an X-ray and yes, the bones are going to be looking weird, you know, but, but it's because the muscles are tight. So, um, so other than rule out some kind of weird bony stuff, I don't think there's no really need for, for x-rays or x-rays in every case that you have a relapse. Okay, then there is another important question that the primary problem of this relapse is because of the lack of compliance. Now, even if we correct it, uh, compliance, poor compliance is going to be there. Will it not lead to a recurrence subsequently? Uh, well, in this case, you know, he's 10 years old. So, uh, I mean, he was compliant until three, which is, you know, not too bad. And he did it, 
relapse right away. So this is one of those cases in which the muscles are not too stiff, but over time, they still have, you know, they get behind the bone, okay, in the growth. So um, at this age, going back to braces is, I would say, I mean, it can be done, but, but it's very, very hard. Um, and, you know, and then after four or five, um, you know, if it would be a two years old, I would say, yes, it's lack of compliance. But we have been talking about compliance. The patient, you know, the foot has to be corrected and the family has to have a brace that is comfortable and you have to educate the family to use the brace. And that's your function and that's your responsibility because that is your treatment. They are treating the patient for you. You are responsible to that kid because the one in the chart is the name of the kid, it's not the name of the parents. So your treatment for that kid is through the parents. So you have to provide the parents with the tools to be successful. So I can overemphasize that comfortable shoes is the key and, and educating the families. And, and so usually up to five, most kids are okay coming back. After five, five, six is kind of hard. I have some that can get to seven or eight, but it's very, very difficult. So, so in these cases, then you have to go to the, to the other pathway, you know, to the other uh, maintenance, which is the anterior tendon transfer. Okay, let's see what, okay, uh, what you, you did in this. Yeah, so just, uh, so how would you brace this kid post-treatment? Nothing? There's no, yeah, there's no need for bracing, bracing after the anterior tendon okay. transfer if it is done properly, okay? So, Great. so this case, this is how it looks like after five casts. And, you know, the casting was done above the knee. Uh, you know, this is not a cast that is kind of easy. Uh, you have to be very careful, like in any cast in club foot. Uh, if it is the first cast that you are doing in your life, I can guarantee you that you are not going to get correction. Uh, you have to spend more time uh, doing the manipulation, doing the stretches is kind of three, four, five minutes. You have to be work, you know, the kids can respond to you. So you, you know, you, you, you ask them and, and you push. And um, what's going to happen is that as, 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 as John said, actually, you know, the first and second car, sometimes you don't get that much correction yeah. because those muscles are stiff. But there's one thing that works in our favor in club foot is that when you put a cast in a leg, any leg, any arm, after two or three weeks, there's atrophy, right? And that atrophy makes things softer. So some in these cases, and the same thing for youngers, the youngers are more flexible, so usually it's more predictable, but after five or six, and we are talking about only 10% of the patients, right? Okay, then after the second cast, then you, you start seeing that you get more correction because that atrophy is helping you. And, um, and usually, as, as Monica said, I mean, every case is different, but you know, this is one of the cases that are pretty bad looking. I mean, it's like, mm, um, you know, five or six cast, seven cast, maybe five to seven is usually enough. But the casting technique, the manipulation, and, and the feeling of how you hold and how you mold and the cast that you use is critical. I mean, it's, uh, and in some hands might take eight casts because you don't have good casting, the cast takes too long to, to, to dry. Uh, you know, I mean, there are other factors, okay? But in the, you know, if you have a good cast, you have a good technique and um, then usually five to seven casts in relapses is enough. So we did that and after we get the foot corrected, it means all the tissues are stretched. Then we did an anterior tendon transfer, a percutaneous tenotomy of the plantar fascia. There's no need to cut a lot. And then in this case, we did a Achilles lengthening uh, open, uh, although uh, you can do it also uh, in a different way, as so we say. And, and this is about four months after the patient had the surgery. And you can see here that he has a very nice gait you know, the foot opens up, um, the heel is in neutralish. Um, this is only three months. It gets better actually after six or eight months. He can walk in the heels. So he has about 10 degrees of dorsiflexion and, and the patient is doing okay. So, so even at this age, and I put this case specifically 
because a two, three years old is, you know, a piece of cake. But even in older patients, and this is kind of the highest you can get, because this is only like 5% of the cases after six, you can get the feet corrected without having to do any other surgery. If you will do any soft tissue releases in these patients, they will get very stiff and they will have problems that we saw before uh, through their life, really, for sure. So, um, sorry, Jose, I just yeah. wanted to ask you that in some of these uh, late uh, sort of relapses, we start with above knee casts for the first two, three casts and then change it to a shorter cast which they can walk in. Is that reasonable or you feel that is not? Uh, I, you know, personally, I think you get more correction with longer casts. Yeah. But um, unless it's, a, as I said, if it's just a mild relapse, then you can go short and with two or three casts. You feel that with two or three casts, you can get a stretch. You know, short leg cast is okay. If you feel that it's not enough, long leg cast is, is better. And it might cut the number of casts that you have to do. Because you so what I'm saying control. is, you sorry. What I'm saying was, you start with long leg cast to get the initial correction or get more correction initially, and then maybe by the third or fourth cast, you change it to a short cast in which the child can walk a bit better. Is that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you know you have to look at you know if that doesn't add you know three more casts for your correction, and yeah. you get a good correction. Yeah. Okay. And it's very difficult because we do to that because the, because the medial side and the cables with a, yeah. with a short leg cast, then sure. it's okay. But, yeah. you know, uh, I, I, I think, uh, you know, you, and, and also the families are coming back and forth and everything. So every trip that you save to that family is, is important. very important for them. And also it's important for you. I mean, this cast, sure. you know, is a 20, 30 minutes deal. Yeah. And, and, and if you save two cars, you are saving, you know, 20, 30 minutes of your clinic to do another cast in a different kid or see three, five more patients. So it makes your training more efficient. So, so that's why the casting technique, you, you have to maximize your, your um, casting to, and the effectivity of the casting effectively. That's, that's the sure. key. So, um, so for the tenotomy, uh, you can do just a percutaneous tenotomy or you can do a hoop procedure. Uh, I have done tenotomies until seven or eight there's a tenotomy and they heal fine. Um, after that, uh, I don't know, I have maybe 20 cases of this kind of old cases. Um, this case that I just showed you, the patient is now 25. So this is, we did it many years ago and we did a formal lengthening, uh, but now you can do a, the procedure that gives you the same. It's critical in these cases, especially in these older ones, to do the casting until you pass neutral with your casting. If you are not neutral, the tenotomy or even the lengthening is not to give you 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. And the reason is because it's not only the, the Achilles, the soleus that is tight, the gastrosoleus, it's all of the other tendons and the capsule. So, so you have to stress the whole soft tissues and muscles with your casting. So don't do the tenotomy or don't decide to do the surgery which the tenorum is part of, until you get neutral or five degrees of dorsiflexion, this is critical, okay? Um, the technique for the transfer uh, was originally described by Garceau in 40s, but he, he used to take it out on the ankle and then go, and then go to the fifth uh, metatarsal. Um, and I think this is from you, uh, this is slight, uh, Chris. And, and this is for you, Chris. Um, so you find the uh, medial side where the tendon is with a two, two and a half centimeters incision. When you release the tendon, don't release it just with here. You have to go and get those six or seven millimeters around the first uniform and the first metatarsal because those are the ones who are going to get into the hole for the transfer, okay? And when you open, never cut with your scissors all the way up because you will cut the retinaculum and then you will get a bow string in, okay? And then you find the third uniform and with a K wire or something and then you drill a hole and, and then you suture the bone. Um, I use non-resorbable. Um, personally, uh, 
I like the more natural way. I uh, usually, uh, I, I, I use a non-reservable stitch. I did Vicryl reservable two or three times. And after six weeks in the cast, the bottom got loose because the Vicryl started getting dissolved. And then the family freaked out because you know they thought that the tendon would be loose. So from that day, I use non-reservable uh, Ethibon or Tech Tech Deck number two usually, and um, and I do a crisscross. Uh, it, um, you don't need to do uh, one of those fancy ones. And the reason for that is you just do a bunel, you know, crisscross, and the, and the uh, and the slide and and the stitch slides. When you take out the cast and you cut the button, if you cut one of the strings and then you pull, all the stitch comes out. <laughs> and so that way is the most natural way to let the tendon heal into the bone with no foreign body. Because anytime you have a foreign body, it's going to create a reaction by, this, by the body. And especially if it is a suture and potentially can affect that tendon integration into the bone. And so that's why I prefer, number one, to use not um, preservable sutures and then to use a suture that by cutting one string, you pull down and everything comes out and then the foot is as natural as it can be. Now, this is a beautiful study by Christoph in which um, he was studying when you do the drilling and um, you know where are the um, uh, structures that are affected and we have the plantar nerves and arteries and there. And he found out, and this is critical uh, when you do this, is that you know the nerves are just right there where the hole is coming. And so he found that when you uh, do 20, de 20 degrees or so uh, on the frontal plane and on the lateral plane about four degrees and you aim to the center, that's the best way to save you know, those structures from being um, affected by the technique. And, um, and I think this is very important. Uh, this is critical. Um, so, so this is relapses. So the truth is that you can treat all the relapses, really. Prevent them with the casting, with the bracing, and then treat them with the casting and tenotomy and um, in idiopathic club food uh, and anterior tendon transfer. And in general, you don't need to use braces after that. Uh, to their question about physiotherapy, they benefit from physiotherapy after the transfers for maybe a month or two uh, to regain a little bit of the flexibility. And because they've been in a cast maybe five or six weeks before, and then six weeks of the casting of the of the tenotomy and uh, and tendon transfer. Um, and very few kids really need any braces after that. But I will ask um, uh, also the the uh, the panel. Uh, what is is their experience on on bracing after the uh, uh, after the transfer? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yes, Monica. What do you think? Like, how do you manage the patient uh, postoperatively? You have said something in the chat. So, can you just uh, tell us, like, how do you manage the patient postoperatively? Well, uh, one time I was. I have finished my surgery and you always let go, let the patient go after six weeks in casts. And some of those feet are just too, too stiff. They are corrected, but you are uh, afraid that as uh, you wait for the tendon, the anterior tendon to, to be strong, there will be a, a loss of flexibility. So Morquendi told me <laughs> to use the brace at night for three months. And that's my protocol after that. And that helps a lot because one, it's very easy to use the brace because the foot are so soft and no problem at all. A family wants to do everything right because the surgery has already been there. So it's a good thing. And after three months, Normally, you let them go and fine, no problem, after the anterior tip transfer, okay? And, but for some feet, you have to bring the, the, the brace back for, for some time if it, you see that lost a lot of 
a lot of dorsiflexion. So you, you reintroduce the brace as the best physical therapy. It's not bad for the physical therapist. Actually, they had a very important, uh, you know, uh, way of helping uh, increasing the, the peroneal tendons because the peroneal tendons have been sleeping for a long time and you need them to rebalance the food. So it's a good idea to do, uh, to wake mm -hmm. up the peroneal tendons. So after a uh, cheap, cheap tendon has been my protocol since Morquendi gave me this tip, is two, three months at night and then you see what's going on. If you don't do the tendon transfer, it's one year at night, uh, even on the grown-ups. Uh, you know, we'll be uh, discussing here and there in the groups on the grown-ups. And uh, actually, uh, they are so happy that the feet are corrected, that the families will be able, yes, to uh, fit on the protocol and use the braces at night. So I don't, I don't see difficulties to, to have these people using the braces at night, even for grown-ups. And it's just for sleeping, right? It's nine, 10 hours maximum. So it's not a big deal. So that that's, uh, has been our protocol. And I think it for the grown-ups helps a lot because if you don't have the transfer, you don't have six weeks waiting on the cast and you need more time for remodeling. So it's very important. So so you can, you can you use these even in the older children above 10, you use the put abduction braces at night. Yes, yes. People come, people come to see those cases and they see the patients themselves putting on the laces and the braces and that's not a big deal. And uh, okay, really, because it's part of treatment. I think uh, one of the things that we don't uh, talk about in this, uh, in this lecture, the lecture was amazing, Jose. We were fantastic yeah. because it's, it's everything about understanding is that don't touch the foot until you talk to the family, because you have to identify the barriers and the problems that you had before, because you don't don't want this child again through the same problems that before that you had before. So talk to to the family for them to understand if they didn't understand what's going on with the foot, and it's not the Ponsetti method, it's not the way of treating, it's the foot, the personality of the foot that behaves like that. So you have to make them understand, and there's not, uh, they cannot choose part of the treatment and not the other. It's like a cardiac medication. You cannot choose the taste, that's it. So uh, I don't want this. So you don't come for treatment. I mean, it's, it's very, uh, we've been so paternalistic trying to, to be nice to the parents and to adapt and you will lose our uh, good results. And then they're very predictable. So if you don't, if you start to change, then make concessions and okay, that's fine. I, you don't like the, like this, you don't like the cast higher up. So I'll put a little, a little down. So, I mean, you, if you are more cheetah in, this, in the sense of doing everything as it should be done, families will, will believe you more. Family, you are more consistent and the treatment will, will go smoother. What do you think, Chris? <laughs> No, I absolutely agree. I think that's a very important point. Uh, so, I mean, for some things, there is no plan B. And this is something I think the families need to understand. And that's something that we need to, to communicate. I think it's very bad if you always say like, well, if you don't, maybe we could do something else. I think there is no plan B for this kind of treatment and what we're doing. Uh, for, for the transfer, what I usually do, I, I have them in a above the knee cast for four weeks. And then I change the cast to a below the knee cast so that they can start to walk with the cast because uh, I think that's something that makes the transition to walking a little bit easier because some, uh, they need quite some time to get into walking again, to be able to, to wait there. So this two weeks walking with the cast, I think makes this a little bit easier. And I think of course, I mean, I think uh, some stretching afterwards is important. So we cut the Achilles tendon, but uh, that's the thing. The other th structures there, they can still prevent more dorsiflexion. So I think it makes sense in some cases when you're not so, um, when you're not so satisfied with dorsiflexion 
to to use a brace uh, for a short time, certain time, to to stretch these other uh, structures, and of course to do some some stretching exercises. Okay, uh, the last question because like we have already overshoot the time. Uh, we will be skipping the case discussion, but one question which uh, one of the participants was asking is, if there is a edematous feet during the plaster treatment, how do we manage? Do we give a risk for the cast or like there is some difference in the treatment? If there is, said, said, if there is what? Edema. You talked about the oh, swelling. Edema. The swelling. Feet. swelling. You showed that case where there was a lot of swelling and you yeah. said that... So, the so the prognosis. The, yeah, the swelling, the swelling doesn't come just because it wants to make your life miserable, right? The swelling happens because your casting technique, for one reason or another, yeah. is not being proper. And and so everybody has to really understand that. It's not the foot, is your casting technique. So but if you get to a point, I mean, and I have you know a number of cases that they swell up a little bit. If it is a little bit of swelling, usually you can you can manage with the casting. That cast is actually very tricky, and, and that's why you need somebody to help you, and not changing every day if you can in a club, in a club foot clinic. Um, it's like in the OR. Um, uh, you have to put the cast with a little tension, like it will be kind of a compressive bandage, not too much, not too little, um, and so trying to squeeze that edema. And usually you do that. In what by next week is okay. If it is a little bit more, then the best is to just wait for a week or 10 days and then start. And and then the next thing, the next time you start, you know, you have to understand you have to be more careful. And and you have to be careful with your stretch, you have to be careful with your stretch in the cast in the last moment of getting because you can stretch a little bit and then you grab it and then you're trying to push it and it's not going to go. So so in those cases. You know, it's a warning for, for you to say, well, we didn't do it right the first time and let's make it so it happened better. So the casting technique is really critical. It's not easy. I mean, being simple doesn't mean that the casting technique in the Ponseti to do it properly is easy. It's, it takes a lot of practice. And I'm going to give you one, just a real life thing. Dr. Ponseti was about 90 and we were working together. I worked with him for until he passed away. And one, one day we were doing the casting in one case and he was about 90 and he was sitting doing the casting, turn around and say, you know, I feel now that I can do a good casting for Clubfoot. And this is real. So, and this is Dr. Ponseti. Seven, 95 years doing casting. So, so it's not an easy cast. It's not easy. And, 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 and the complications are complication, iatrogenic complications of your casting. And, and so it's very critical that everybody develop the right skills for the casting. Otherwise, it's not that the Ponseri method doesn't work. It's that when applied properly, it actually works all the time. Very rarely, you cannot turn a foot around. I, I mean, in my experience, I never had that chance unless it was a weird thing. Okay, so Can with that, uh, Jos, uh, no, Viraj, yeah. now we will be ending the session because we are already uh, 15 minutes overdue. So uh, now I request uh, Dr. Venkat to uh, like have a vote of thanks. Dr. Venkat. Good evening, everybody. On uh, behalf of POSI, I would like to thank uh, today's guest speaker, uh, Dr. Jose Marquende, for absolutely uh, fantastic uh, overview on Ponseti's technique. You rightly mentioned that you emphasize the fact that Ponseti is a philosophy by itself and not just a casting technique. It was amazing. And uh, I also would like to thank the panelists, uh, Dr. Chris, uh, Monica, and our own uh, national uh, panelist, Dr. Viraj, and the Dr. Uh, John Mukopadaya. And just to summarize the things, uh, Dr. Jose, today uh, uh, the theme was about uh, relapse of uh, relapse club feet, and he rightly said that prevention should be the first thing, and you try to prevent the relapse. That was the main uh, thing in his lecture, and uh, 
he said also said that as a surgeon you have to owe the responsibility that the child should wear the brace and he said that he should make sure you choose the right comfortable shoes so that the child wears the shoes and then he of course in the best of the hands he said that they have a relapse rate of about 12% and we should accept that about 10 to 15% relapse is going to happen and then we treat the relapses following the same principles of ponsetti like stretching and casting followed by tenotomy and then bracing and tibialis anterior transfer thank you so much for the wonderful uh, lecture and discussion and i also would like to thank uh, ortho tv for sponsoring this event thank you one and all thank you bye 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 thank you bye yeah uh, josh what i would suggest is like uh, still uh, you had uh, two or three case discussion and our indian experts also had a case discussion so can we have a second part of the session later on like say, after two or three months yes absolutely that would be perfect yeah because like uh, what you say today is really something uh, very important that uh, you really have to be after fit it's not like that uh, the first relapse you straight may go for surgery so that philosophy is really difficult for us to accept so probably two or three more case example and more interaction will definitely help us perfect i would be happy and we will be happy to uh, share actually what we can do is to share cases uh, you know the three of us uh, so people can see you know real life yeah okay thank you very much Thank Please. you Christopher and thank you Monica. Thank good you. night for you. Bye. Yeah, bye. Good night and yes, good day for you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Okay, bye. 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 Yes, Ashok, thank you. Thank you sir. Yeah, recording function hai aapko.